Hello and welcome to the last session of the second day of the Reform Conference. I'm Stephanie Jones, um, the event manager for this conference. Um, some of you may also know me in my alter ego, which is a big proponent of nightlife harm reduction and drug policy reform. So I'm very pleased right now to be having this roundtable discussion about emerging drugs. And I'm also pleased that this session has the most interesting title of any of the sessions. <laughs> um, so I hope that's appreciated. Um, we have an amazing assembly of speakers here today. I'm just going to go through quickly to identify them and before we kick off the discussion. Um, starting at the far end, Carissa Cornwell, who's with Dance Safe here in the United States. Tim Bingham with HSC Addiction Services from Limerick City, Ireland, which is, that's the real name of his city, Limerick City. Welcome, Tim. <laughs> Ross Bell from the New Zealand Drug Foundation, who some of you may have seen on the plenary earlier today. Welcome, Ross. James Dunn with Chen Palmer New Zealand Law. So he represents actually the legal highs industry in New Zealand. Very lucky to have him. Welcome, James. <laughs> Maria Carvalho, who is a psychologist with the Catholic University in Porto in Portugal. But more famously, you may know her. She runs the uh, harm reduction services at the Boom Festival in, for in Portugal. Welcome, Maria. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, my colleague at Drug Policy Alliance, Grant Smith, who is our federal drug policy manager and a specialist in this area. Welcome, Grant. So we have a lot of interesting um, accents on this round table. <laughs> Um, so I want to start off with um, the most common question when it comes to emerging drugs, really around um, terminology and what are they. Like, we talk about emerging drugs, we talk about synthetic drugs, we talk about NPS, which is an acronym for novel or psychoactive substances. What else we got? Do you guys remember any of the other names on there? What is it? Oh yeah, there's just like so many different terms. So a lot of these are used interchangeably. So it's not just identifying what the substance is, it is just figuring out what we're even gonna call these class of drugs. A friend of mine introduced this term called alphabetamines, which I think is pretty clever. It's all these letters and numbers strung together and nobody really knows what it is. Um, so I wanted to start off before we really get into the discussion by just having um, Carissa kind of identify for us some of the main classes of what falls under synthetic drugs so we all kind of understand what we're talking about. Well, um, <clears throat> the bath salts um, would be considered cathinones. Um, there's a wide range of different cathinones. <clears throat> Other things that I've been seeing is uh, methoxetamine, uh, 2,5-I, NBMOE. Um, and then there's so, a bunch more different ones. Um, and do you guys want to, um, in New Zealand, I think, James, you were saying that it's mostly synthetic cannabinoids that you're... That, that's right. Um, originally, those were sort of classical research chemicals that I think the first, first ones have been developed as alternatives to cannabinoids for use in, res in medical research. Uh, over the last two or three years, most of the new, the new, new synthetic cannabinoids we've seen have been designed for that purpose. They're usually um, developed in a laboratory overseas, synthesized usually in China, and then shipped to New Zealand. And those have been designed, as I say, explicitly for recreational purposes. They're not otherwise used. Most of them are subject to patent, although the industry has, I'm afraid to say, a very robust approach to intellectual property um, in that particular field. So usually once a substance turns up, everyone else rips it off within a couple of days. Uh, but yeah, mostly New Zealand has mostly been synthetic cannabinoids and increasingly you know, cannabinoids designed for that purpose. Okay, so we have a class of drugs called cathinones. We have our synthetic cannabinoids. Um, Grant, did you want to add any others once to the mix? 
Yes, there is um, what is known the two Cs, uh, which I don't know a lot about, but my understanding is that they are designed to be hallucinogens, and um, they, they're more they're research chemicals, and they're they're not they're not as prevalent, but um, they have, some of them have already been banned here in the United States. Okay, so we have cathinones, um, which I think kind of is the MDMA sort of amphetamine sort of type of legal highs imitations. We have synthetic cannabinoids, which obviously mirrors uh, the effects of marijuana. And then we have two CIs, which is kind of a hallucinogenic sort of mirror. So right now, everything under emerging drugs kind of mirrors our whole known class of drugs. So we're dealing with a very broad field. And so you can imagine the challenge when it comes to harm reduction, which is the focus of this discussion, um, trying to do harm reduction. It's like trying to do harm reduction for all drugs. So we have to kind of break it down and get a little bit um, into the nitty gritty to find out how we can best do harm reduction on this entirely very wide, diverse class of emerging drugs. Um, I want to also point out the fact that two years ago at this conference, we had uh, another session on emerging drugs, which Grant was on. So I want to give, I'm going to ask him to give us a little picture about just how different the field was two years ago. So as we jump into this conversation where we have people from New Zealand that we all know are doing some very exciting new stuff, we can see two years ago um, what was happening and that'll lead us into what we want to talk about today. So whereas today we have zombies and mad scientists, two years ago we had emerging drug criminalization trends. And uh, that really summed up what we were dealing with two years ago. We had, um, we had, for about two years, we'd had synthetic cannabinoids in the United States and getting a lot of media attention and some sporadic claims of, you know, teen suicides and, and, and other sort of bizarre things and some scary things that may or may not have happened um, during that time period. And then you had... More recently, within the year, within a year of the of the panel two years ago, you had the emergence of, of um, the synthetic uh, uh, cathinines, um, bath salts, ivory wave, and that was more prevalent in the media at the time. And together, these drugs were getting criminalized left and right, both at the state level, but also at the federal level. And uh, by the end of 2011, you had at least 39, 40 states in the United States had criminalized at least something. Um, either more, more so the synthetic uh, cannabinoids, but also beginning to work at some of the, the, fir the first way that the cathinines as well. And, um, and so I want to point out that they were working on banning the first wave of synthetic cannabinoids. Um, even as they were banning the first wave of synthetic cannabinoids, the K2s, the spices, there was another wave coming behind it. And, and, and you saw this sort of this, uh, this phenomenon happening where they were banning it, the law was taking effect, for K2, and the next day, K3 was coming out. Okay, lawmakers are scratching their heads. What are we going to do? You know, we, we got to go through this legislative process all over again. Also, the congressional level where I was working at the time, um, we were work trying to stop uh, the cr criminalization of 30 uh, different substances, cannabinoids, cathinines, and some of the hallucinogens as well. And we saw it then as an opportunity to raise the issue of prohibition and that this approach doesn't work. The, the idea that we can just ban these things, ban the people who use them, and suddenly it will just turn the, turn the faucet off. Um, and we, what resulted was a fairly robust conversation in Congress around the failures of the war on drugs, the need for a, a new scheduling system, essentially, a scheduling system that um, was more agile and, and could, could actually address this problem. Uh, because uh, the scheduling system we had was basically either you ban it, or, um, or you treat it as a medical issue, and, and no one was willing to see a medical benefit out of using synthetic marijuana. And so they were just putting it in Schedule 1, which, you know, of course, resulted in federal mandatory minimum sentencing and, and uh, the criminalization of people who were just using these substances. And so, um, and so another, another thing that we talked about two years ago was why were people using these? You know, at that time, we were still trying to understand, like, what, what's the appeal of bath salts and what's the appeal of synthetic marijuana? And, you know, of course, the, the short answer is that, you know, evading drug tests, uh, the criminalization issue, these things were not illegal um, in, many, in many places, or were starting to become illegal, but they hadn't fully become illegal yet. And so there was that appeal there. Um, and also, the, the, considering, you know, the global economy, the, uh, the, the reality that we're dealing with something that's on a global scale, as, as James mentioned um, uh, moments ago, that, you know, we're talking about something that's made in China, shipped to, to another country, 
the, the sale is made in another country and then it's imported to the United States, um, and that there's really no, it's beyond the reach of government, and that we need a new regulatory approach, a regulatory approach that at the time we didn't know what it would look like exactly, but it would have elements uh, perhaps similar to what, how we deal with tobacco, along with some other you know, more stringent uh, controls around scientific inquiry, uh, scientific study allowing sci scientists to study these cannabinoids rather than completely ban them, uh, something that you know, we were dealing with and continue to deal with. Um, and, and this continues today. Uh, re uh, you know, right now there's a bill in Congress that would, um, that, that is being driven by the DEA, it was practically written by the Drug Enforcement Administration, which is the federal, the U.S. Uh, federal Drug Enforcement Agency, um, that would um, allow them to ban anything that they even identify or know about um, without even knowing what the effect is on the human body. It's uh, basically redefining the analog, or revising the analog definition under the Controlled Substances Act here in the United States so that they can say, we assume this is going to do this to the human body, so we're going to ban it. And we're going, to give the 30 day, we're going to give the public only 30 days to weigh in on this. And this bill is actually pending before the Congress right now. So you're seeing, so in other words, today in the United States, we're seeing the same response to this, the response of prohibition, the response of you know, we're not going to deal with this as a health issue, we're going to deal with this as a punitive issue. Um, but we do know a little bit more about what's happening, and we, and we, we can also um, perhaps have some, and we have some examples from elsewhere about how we can possibly better deal with this. And I just want to mention, too, that we also have um, issues like things that emerge that are not necessarily new drugs, but um, are emerging drugs in the United States, like crocodile and uh, kratom, um, other substances that um, have been around for a while or even longer, but are new to the United States and create this media hysteria mm -hmm. around it. Okay, and those uh, congressional hearings were as recently as three weeks ago or something like that, isn't that right? That's right. Okay, and we still don't know very much about use patterns of all these different substances in the United States. I'm actually going to ask Carissa about that in a little bit, but first I want to give a picture of what's happening in Europe. Um, I'm going to ask Maria and Tim to give us a little um, Little, little shot of like what's going on in, in Portugal and in Ireland as relates to which substance is most commonly used and just a quick you know shot of like what the policy is for those. So Ma Maria, do you want to start off? So um, the scenario in Portugal um, uh, is as very recent um, developments. Um, during uh, 2013, so precisely this year, uh, new re regulation was uh, was approved, um, which represents, uh, unfortunately, some kind of uh, lost opportunity to um, keep on with uh, with our decriminalization policy. Um, the context is that uh, taking advantage of the um, uh, um, new substances emerging, not unclassified uh, uh, for 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 the moment at the time, um, there was the this um, um, arousal of uh, smart shops uh, opening uh, um, uh, all over the country, um, some of, uh, focusing mainly on uh, hotspot uh, urban areas uh, very associated with nightlife, and uh, with uh, um, synthetic uh, alternatives to, uh, legalized alternatives to, to cocaine, mostly being the most, uh, um, uh, the most uh, um, bought um, and, um, and considered more interesting to, to, to users, um, but also the alternatives to, to psychedelics. And um, following uh, some media hysteria uh, on, on this phenomena of smart shops, because queues could Get really big uh, um, in downtown uh, in downtown Lisbon, downtown Porto, where life nightlife is more uh, 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 active. Um, following this um, uh, phenomena and this uh, urge in the media, uh, uh, alarms started started to come from uh, emergency episodes uh, related with this with these with these products. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, before this was properly uh, researched and characterized and described. Um, there was uh, uh, this urge to deal with the public health menace. 
Uh, and um, Portugal uh, uh, has recently uh, adhered to the to the um, EU uh, regula um, uh, orientation in this matter, which is to m be part of an early uh, alert system that uh, easily identifies, uh, quickly identifies all the products, keeps all the countries uh, in connection, um, and inside nationally uh, what this has translated to has been to um, a system that uh, uh, as soon as this, a new substance is identified it is automatically integrated in a listed uh, in a list of uh, prohibited substances right so, so this was actually the this is interesting because portugal of course follows the decriminalization model which so there's no penalties for personal possession yes. of drugs yes and yet so this is yes. relatively recently they Very chose recent. to take the new substances that were being yes. identified and just stick them under the criminal law anyway um, it is uh, uh, so the, the it's not under the criminal law because the the, the framework is still an uh, uh, administrative law mm -hmm. and the sanctions that uh, came out of that are mostly um, um, on the form of payment of of, uh, of uh, charges um, so um, what this has uh, the most important consequence of course has been that uh, smart shops started to, to, to close all over because they weren't exactly pronounced illegal, but their activity was severely menaced, so uh, uh, um, they, they couldn't uh, find uh, a reason to, to, to keep open. Um, and um, of course, there's a lost opportunity to, uh, um, in first, first of all, I, this is my personal opinion, um, to uh, have this spe special context where users will uh, will be um, that could have trained people. The situation as it was couldn't really uh, be maintained because there was a lot of misinformation. Products were being sold as as salts, as fertilizers. Um, uh, information on the on the packages wasn't accurate. Uh, there it, it, there was a real uh, health menace, but. Other than trying to uh, um, decipher what was going on, describe the phenomena, invest in researching these products, their use patterns, their users, um, there was this immediate reaction, very typical, very um, um, disappointing, in fact, uh, which was to uh, um, immediately go forward with a more repressive, uh, uh, with a more repressive answer, um, and this, unfortunately as closed users to the internet circuit where everything is anonymous, where no quality is guaranteed. Um, uh, crisis and emergency episodes will not be uh, um, put to an end because of this or reduced professionals in the field, mostly the less trained ones won't be better, better adjust to deal with the, with the problem. Uh, and of course, uh, new, new products will keep on appearing uh, as the, the identified substances go into the list. So Right, right. Um, so we see that there's still a, a harm reduction imperative that's still not quite happening in Portugal. There's still a lot of challenges to address. So actually, your 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 point about it moving to an online market actually is a perfect segue to uh, Tim Bingham, who is a, knows quite a bit about Silk Road, possibly more than certainly more than anyone else that I know. Um, so Tim, can you give us a little picture about like? So it sounds like in Portugal, it's a lot of recreational use. Uh, cocaine-like legal highs, hallucinogen-like legal highs. They have the problem with the the head shops or the the shops on the street. So is that is that at all similar to the situation in Ireland? And then can maybe can you say a little bit about the the use of the online um, bu buying yeah. portals? Okay. Um, first of all, I think I mean uh, I think Ireland was the first con EU country to actually bring in any sort of psychoactive substance law in 2011. Uh, up until then, I have to say it was pretty. It was a pretty mad place to live. Um, we had a lot of head shops. Um, you could have in you know a population of fourteen thousand. You could have two or three head shops in one area. Um, they were open seven days a week. They were doing they were doing uh, home deliveries. Um, they were open twenty four hours a day. There was a lot of young people. Um, I was talking about this earlier. There was a lot of young people who were coming into detention who ne never had previous um, convictions or even come in uh, any, um, had actually come to attention of the law, you know, law enforcement beforehand. And a lot of, there were these, these young people were actually getting, um, 
mostly through methadrone, as a lot of you probably know it. Um, we use it because that was very popular at the time. And really, it's, I suppose that's quite, you know, a, lot, a lot of work actually coming in, to, in co um, contact with um, A&E and the psychiatric services. So that kind of really, and obviously the media got onto that as well. So that kind of really led on to the whole thing around the prohibition. Uh, not on prohibition, the, the uh, dismantlization, dismantlization of, the, of the head shops. Um, now where we are today, we've still got a lot of um, underground, obviously underground um, substances. We still see, interesting enough, we had a lot of, um, up until about 2011, we had about three methadrone, if you, people know about it, and then it became four methadrone. Um, recently we had a, a seizure of, of three methadrone, which I haven't seen for the last couple of years, which is quite, for me, is quite interesting. Um, a lot of this, in, a lot of the stuff that was coming was coming in from um, was been was been synthesised in China. Um, so that's kind of where we are today. I mean, the speaking to speaking to work, to, speaking to drugs workers, and to the the guard or the police in in Ireland. Since the head shops have actually been closed, there has been a reduction in young people coming in contact with, with the law and in, 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 in regards to mental health services. Um, but what, we, what we've certainly seen a, a, a growth in the, sort of in, in the synthetic cannabinoids because we, there's a large, um, there have been very large seizures of cannabis in Ireland. Um, it's obviously taken them off the market. So obviously once that's been taken off, something, if something else comes on, on come, something else comes in. Um, regarding, I suppose, Silk Road, I suppose I've been, I've been on Silk Road for about the last two years. Uh, primarily, I started off as a harm reduction worker. Um, it was really Monica Barrett in Australia, I blame her really for getting me involved, um, having a good old chat with her one night. And, and, um, but what I, what I was finding was a lot of these people on Silk Road, um, there was two, there was two parts of it, there was, the, 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 I suppose there was the forum side, and there was the side that sold the drugs. What I was finding is that the, the forum was more like a community. And it was a community of people who wanted information about, I don't know, coming down off MDMA. And a lot of us were sort of talking about the whole thing around serotonin regulation. And, you know, really, you know some very, very interesting um, topics were happening. Um, we, there was even a Spanish um, general practitioner People could actually, you know, just just, eat, you know, just drop him a line on on Silk Road. There was a number of pharmacists um, who were both contributing, and I would say probably um, acting as vendors as well. Um, but the the interesting thing about Silk Road is that it did create um, one, it created a community, but it also created a some form of regulate regulation that was going on within the community because it was the community who actually kind of held um, the vendors to account. So if they got a bad batch of whatever, they would basically put, put, that, on, put, put that on the forum. And obviously it was rated, it, it, was, it was rated. So if you had a rating of less than 98%, you were classed as a crap vendor, basically by, by people, and people wouldn't go through them. Um, the, and interesting enough, there was, there was another part, there was another, there was, Outside of Silk Road, on another on another site, you could actually go onto it, and you could actually determine which uh, cocaine vendor was better than other, you know, was was better than other, because that was all that, that, that testing was already going on, and the vendors I interviewed um, all did their own testing, um, and they either have their own drug testing kits, or they'd actually know exactly what's going into those substances. So there was a kind of a um, an ethos that you know we want we want our products to be really good, and the other, the other very interesting thing about it as well is that the um, when I was speaking when I was speaking to them, a, a number of them uh, mentioned that uh, under 18 had you know people um, had said you know they were under 18, and there was an ethic with with some of the vendors they wouldn't actually sell to under 18s, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. So you're saying that there's a lot of so having this online place actually helped provide a lot of harm reduction in that there was an honest venue for people to like rate things, people know that they would be held accountable to what was there. Yeah. So that's the benefit of Silk Road. As opposed, so when we see actually that there's the head shops which people react to and that seems to kind of bring down some prohibition sort of knee-jerk reactions, whereas Silk Road, 
created more of an environment wherein we could, maybe we didn't still know, like things weren't precisely labeled, but if you had somebody who bought something that was bad batch, yeah. you found out about it. I didn't so try, yeah. I'm, I'm going to actually go on to Carissa because she's doing the real, like, on the, on the ground, literally, at festivals and venues, like seeing these things come up to the Dance Safe booth and people wanting to know what is this and how, how can I be safe and that sort of thing. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience in, yeah. the, in the real world doing this? Yeah, um, you know, I would say probably 75 to 80% of the stuff that we tested um, over the summer was not what it was supposed to be. Um, and so with that being said, you know, it's definitely a s scary market to go to an event and try to, you know, buy something that you think might be MDMA. The chances of you getting MDMA are very small. Um, the chances of you getting something that could be much more harmful to you is definitely probably more the case than you than you finding MDMA. Um, <clears throat> uh, we. We definitely um, feel that there's a need to, for testing. Um, Silk Road was great because everything that was bought and sold on Silk Road was what it was supposed to be. If you wanted to buy a cathinone, you could buy a cathinone. Um, if you wanted to buy MDMA, you could buy MDMA. Um, and so I think that, that with the Silk Road going down, it's, it kind of makes me more nervous because I, you know, for a while there, it was pretty, it was pretty good. Everybody that had had what they thought they were supposed to, and um, it was all because they had bought it off Silk Road. So two quick questions for you. So these, you know, we're big proponents of testing kits and people knowing what's in their substances, but how useful are they for the emerging drugs? Like if somebody's like, oh, I really wanted um, methadrone, like is this white powder it? Does it work? Yes, definitely. And I've had people, t you know, I've performed you know, two different tests for people. One tend ended up being MDMA, one was the cathinone. And this girl looks at me and she's like, well, what if I like that other one better? Because she didn't like the MDMA, she liked the cathinone. And how often do you see that? Like, is it in, in, out there in festivals, like, are people really preferring these things? Do you see that a lot of people are either preferring them or asking questions about them? I think a lot of it is that there's such, um, there's, the market is flooded with cathinones that most of these most of these people that are taking it don't even know the difference, probably, mm -hmm. um, unless they've had a, had a test performed for them. Um, and so, and lack of information, I think that that's a big thing, too. Um, mm -hmm. The less they know, the less they know. Right. You know? So let's actually go back to Maria, because, and I'm going to ask now about your experience specifically with the Boom Festival. Um, that's a, a festival that happens every two years, right, in Portugal. So why don't you tell us, for the people in the crowd that may not know what Boom Festival is all about, give us a little explanation of what sure. that is and then how harm reduction works at this festival. Okay. So um, Boom is an um, is, um, event that takes place every two years in Portugal. Um, the, the, the festival uh, has a, ve a very large dimension. You can imagine it's a venue that gathers over 30,000 people uh, from over 100 different countries uh, for a week. Uh, um, and um, in a very isolated and recluded area of, uh, of in, in, in interior Portugal, which isn't such a big uh, geographical <laughs> uh, context to, take, to keep in mind. Uh, anyway, it gets uh, really isolated. Um, um, climate conditions are also very, very harsh with very high temperatures. Um, so uh, um, the context of uh, risk and uh, reactions uh, people might have to psychoactives uh, and to, to the environmental factors themselves are a bit amplified. But boom, it's mu is much, much more than that. Um, it has won consecutively for the third uh, edition in 2012, the uh, United Nations Award for an uh, Outstanding Greener Festival. Uh, it promotes the values of sustainability, care, um, uh, culture. It cannot lo no longer be considered a psychedelic trance festival 
it, uh, um, uh, exclusively. So it, 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 it appeals to an enormous uh, uh, array of, uh, of people of, uh, uh, of different uh, um, characteristics, culturally speaking. Um, and um, what has happened in the in Boom Festival is that um, because of this conscience of uh, promoters, uh, um, um, since very early on, uh, in, back at back at 2002, a spontaneous uh, um, organization of uh, volunteers uh, started to be aware of the need to do something about the difficult situations that could uh, emerge during the festival festival uh, um, uh, related to the use of substances. Uh, and the organization uh, uh, of BOOM asked uh, uh, in the initial uh, in, uh, editions, uh, asked MAPS to uh, implement um, uh, a service uh, to, of care to the, to, the, to the people in the festival. So this service was uh, um, hired, um, uh, um, organizers hired MAPS to to, to present the service for, for a number of years. Uh, anyway, this, the experience was at the, at the beginning very spontaneous. It relied mostly on volunteer work, it still does, um, but it was very, very spontaneous in the way it was offered. Um, always with, uh, with support from, or, from, from the organizers. But what is our effort uh, since we've been involved uh, in the project has been to really start uh, doing some research and evaluating what we are doing, describing the process uh, that was already being used, um, create um, um, a better understanding of uh, how it should be implemented. And the, the, pro the, the, the project actually includes a number of different strategies. So it has been possible for a number of editions to offer um, thin layer chromatography uh, testing service, which is usually offered uh, in, in um, that's the good stuff, right? That's, That's the best kind. The, the, the thin layer? Yeah. The thin layer, uh, maybe it's worth t saying, uh, is uh, um, it's a, pro a testing process that allows you not only to say whether the product product is or not what you are expecting it to be, but it also identifies the percentage and number and types of adulterants involved. So the kind of feedback that it offers to users is extremely accurate uh, uh, and provides uh, uh, the safest uh, information and reliable, reliable information you can obtain. And let me ask you, because I heard something in another panel. I heard that when you get stuff tested, first of all, there are signs that say Drug, che drug checking at near the dance tent yes. at this time that happens. Yes, this is totally acknowledged by the right. festival. So it's advertised, and they tell you yes. where exactly to go. Then you go and you get this high tech, yes. fancy checking. Yes. And then I also heard that they put the results up like on a big. They do. That's so crazy. in 2012, uh, uh, a daily report on the results of testing was being offered by the new WIP team. So we partnered up with uh, a EU f uh, EU funded project uh, that uh, has people from a number of teams in doing this kind of work in all over Europe, um, um, a group called TEDI. Um, and uh, um, they have a project which is specifically related to testing, which is NEWIP. So we partnered up with, uh, uh, Cosmic Air partnered up with NEWIP to guarantee the, the, the testing service. And um, uh, um, what they, were, they helped us do and implemented uh, on their initiative during the last edition was a daily report on the results of testing, so uh, uh, and also uh, al alerts uh, that could be distributed in um, specific areas of the festival, like the restaurants or the dance floor, um, that would identify uh, um, some risk uh, uh, situations that people should be aware of. Um, we had a, a particular situation in, the, in 2012, which was there was a shortage of LSD all over all over Europe uh, the, the uh, last year. Um, and this usually represents um, uh, increased work for cosmic care. So uh, there were um, these blue microdots were being sold as LSD. In fact, they weren't. They were DOB, DOC, DOE. So people were unaware of it, uh, uh, and uh, this meant uh, a huge number of uh, extremely severe uh, reactions uh, of um, uh, uh, physical agitation, aggressiveness, um, very very intense episodes. Uh, for 
extenuating hours, like over a day sometimes, and people are, are unaware of this because because uh, LSD doesn't usually take this long to, to peak. Um, so the fact that we were constantly uh, um, getting feedback from the testing also helped us at the crisis intervention uh, setting, which doesn't happen in the same place in the, in the, in the festival, so drug testing is near the dance floor, and then cosmic care uh, uh, crisis intervention area is in another s space, quiet, more quiet, more, more uh, protected from, from public. And, um, uh, and the fact that we were in constant feedback allowed us also to be aware of what situations we were receiving, the potential uh, uh, um, motives, um, offered samples, uh, for them to, to, to keep track. So this, uh, um, this double, um, double um, intervention is in fact uh, what should happen. And not only, so not only is the, the testing, the crisis intervention, and also close work with paramedics mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, safety staff. So um, this meant that every situation in the festival being uh, um, being appearing, um, we would get a call on our radio. We would go there to pick up the person if the person couldn't come by its, by themselves. So we have a, 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 a and and the articulation with the medical staff allowed a, a quick evaluation of the situation there, whether it was from. Health, and the medical health incidents that risk. were happening, were they mostly involving new drugs or were they all <coughs> no, different kinds? No, uh, The testing results for 2012 show us that 47% uh, of the samples are MDMA with 80% purity. So it, 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 is in fact, uh, it is in fact a different scenario than perhaps what you have. Uh, research chemicals aren't uh, particularly prevalent because um, LSD has 15% uh, uh, um, of samples, cocaine uh, 7 7%, um, and then 6% unknown substances, 7% other substances. So, uh, amphetamines, perhaps after cocaine, uh, if I recall, and uh, so it, it isn't something you uh, would uh, um, exactly see uh, uh, translated in the, in the information we have on the testing, but uh, it is true that in the 2010 edition, we identified from our visitors' uh, reports at Cosmic Air a list of over 40 s different substances. Uh, okay, so we see that there is a, a range of like these new substances being used, but for the most part, it's still the classic... The classics. It is, it is, yes. The and boom is perhaps uh, very representative of, of what the pattern is uh, a bit all over Europe and the world, uh, even though supply is being perhaps uh, offered right. mostly by uh, Portuguese traffickers. <laughs> right. So boom festival being a model then for what can be done to kind of engage harm reduction on the most, the highest level at a festival. Um, I want to, I want to turn now to uh, our New Zealanders and hear a little bit more about what a little bit about what the situation was that led up to um, the, the new law that they have in place and what that can, has impacted in terms of harm reduction outreach in your country. I don't know, J or Ross or James, you want to start? I thought it was interesting that you were talking about uh, emergency scheduling orders because we tried that in New Zealand for a year and a half. Uh, we had a regime where the Minister, the minister of Health could issue a notice which banned, banned the commercial sale and supply of a substance with seven days to get rid of it. Uh, we banned 38 substances, I think. Uh, I don't think a day went by when you could not legally buy synthetic cannabis in New Zealand. It just did not work. And it set, it actually created really bad incentives for the industry because it didn't make sense to make a product that was easy to identify or to put labels on it or to you know, be open and upfront with the government about what you were doing. So what you'd get is, is the same product, but it would have half a dozen different ingredients. And as they were identified, they would be banned one by one and replaced with new ingredients. So where we got to after a year and a half was we ran as fast as we could to stay in the same place. Now, to the, to the, to the New Zealand government's credit, they knew going into that that wasn't going to work. They actually said that. It's, it's a stopgap, and they knew that. Um, but it, you know, temporary banning orders, what I think they did, for, certainly in New Zealand, was really bring the failures of the prohibition model. It happened really quickly. Like, you know, with, with um, say, a traditional drug, you can ban it and then 40 years down the line, oh, wait, crap, it's still available. Or look at all these problems. Whereas with, with uh, the, the temporary banning regime we had, you could ban it and 20 minutes later something else would be available. So you, you really got that, just how ineffective it was. It was just really, really driven home. So where that got us to was the Psychoactive Substances Act, which took a long time to develop. It was a very, very painful birth. Uh, basically, the... 
the crux of the act is that if you can demonstrate that a particular product poses a low risk of harm to people who use it, you'll get approved. And the evidence you have to put forward for that is clinical, is clinical and preclinical trials. So it's a very high bar. Uh, for example, it's, you know, the government said if you put alcohol through the same process, it would be declined. Tobacco would be declined. Um, probably most of the control, almost all of the controlled drugs we have would probably be declined. So it is, it is a very, very, very high bar. From a harm reduction perspective, though, there are a number of things about it that I think are quite promising. Uh, first of all, you're required to put, when you have an approved product, you have to put what's in it on the label. Uh, you have to put a health warning that explains exactly, if, 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 the, if the side effects are, oh, I don't know, nausea, you've got to say nausea. Um, you can't advertise at all. Uh, you can't claim that the product is safe. Uh, it has to be sold from a licensed retailer. So there's a lot more control over, over the market and a lot better understand what it's meant from a health professional's perspective, I think, is that before people would come in and say, oh, I smoke some chronic. Well, great, you know, which of the 200 different cannabinoids were you using? <laughs> Whereas now if someone comes in and says, I smoked um, a Juicy Puff or something and I got sick, the, um, yeah, I'm afraid the names are... That's the real name, the Juicy product, Puff. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. The product names are not, are not um, distinguished by their maturity, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, at least if, if you come in and say, I smoked Juicy Puff, I got sick, um, the clinician can look it up on the, on the register and be like, oh, okay, so it's you know, whatever what is in that 5-FAKB42 or something. And they'll know what it is, and they'll know what the reported effects are, and they can feed that back in to the, to the regulatory authority in the long run so we can build a better picture around how these... Because a lot of these, these new substances, we know virtually nothing about them. And they've been designed, and particularly with New Zealand synthetic cannabinoids, they have been designed by New Zealand, you know, market players for use in the New Zealand market. So they're extremely new. There's virtually no literature about them. The literature we do have available is about uh, the cannabinoids we banned two years ago. So it's not that useful <laughs> for us going forward. Um, the other thing I think it's important for me, and it's interesting you were talking about uh, sort of purity as an issue. In the long run, it's intended that there will be a code of manufacturing practice for manufacturers. It'll be akin to sort of GMP pharmaceutical level processes. So there'll be a high level of purity in theory, um, a really good understanding of what's going on, and probably a lot more control over the market and a much better understanding about what's, what's actually happening, who's using what, who's buying it, what happens when they use it. I mean, obviously, that said, there are a whole bunch of issues with the act, which perhaps Ross. You know, we're New Zealanders, we love to complain, so... Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone in that. We've got, yeah, I mean, there are, there are... The biggest conceptual issue of the Act, obviously, is it only applies to new substances, uh, not medicines, nothing that's already banned, uh, not herbal remedies, not tobacco, not alcohol. So it's a good model, but it's, it's only, it only covers a very small, you know, wedge of the market. And if you want to go out and buy, you know, cocaine, well, tough. You know, you still have to, you still have to go to your dealer. Whereas if you want to buy... The, the sort of cocaine derivative that someone came up with and managed to convince the authority you should be able to sell, fine, go down to the shop, you know, great, get a receipt. Um, so there are, there are, conceptually, there are some sort of inconsistencies in how it all fits together. So that, yeah, I mean... That kind of begs the question, actually, because um, some people have brought up the fact, you know, despite what New Zealand's doing, it's amazing, we're all big fans, it's a very forward-thinking policy. It's kind of like, well, um, we kind of know what the harms of cocaine are, and we kind of know what the harms of MDMA are, but with all of these, even the new ones that are being developed, like you just said, we don't really know. So how is, how is the industry or, or, or policy or people in New Zealand addressing that question? To get approval, it's not just a matter of sort of asserting that your substance is low risk. At, in the long run, you will have to produce um, clinical data that will replicate something along the lines of a phase one pharmaceutical trial. So we're not looking at proving efficacy because, you know, if it sucks, that's your problem. But you will have to prove that it's safe or low risk, and that's going to have to be based on, you know, at probably, unfortunately, animal testing or something akin to that, and then clinical trials with human patients. So we, will ha we don't have much of an understanding of what's on the market now, by the time products receive formal approval, which may not be for a year or so, we'll have a really good understanding about what those products are and what the risks, the risks are from using them. Okay. And did you want to add to that, Ross? Because I'm about to ask him some tough questions about his employers. <laughs> Go for gold. So, I mean, the interesting thing about James is that he works for um, some of the people that make uh, these legal highs. So why don't you tell us how you got that cool job? Uh, well, <laughs> actually... <laughs> um, 
I mean, technically, technically my employer, I'm, I work for a law firm in Wellington, um, and they came to us many years ago with a range of issues. Um, over the last couple of years, increasingly it's become my area, area of specialty. I mean, part of that, and one thing I think is interesting about the New Zealand context that is probably different to a lot of places overseas, is the legal hires industry operates semi-openly. You know, they have limited liability companies and shareholders, and they instruct accountants and lawyers to write crappy letters to each other and all that sort of thing. So uh, there's always been a level of openness. And reflected in that, and I'm usually slacking off, slacking off our Ministry of Health, so it's nice to be different, the Ministry has always been very interested in what, the, in what the industry has to say. I mean, during the process of the Act, they would come to us with things and say, do you think this will work? You know, is this, is this a goer? And we'd say, well, no, it's not. I mean, a classic example was that it was around this whole issue of data, exclu uh, data exclusivity. Um, under the Act, you, when you get your product approved, the, the, you, have, you have five years exclu exclusivity around the, the clinical safety data used to get over the line, which means somebody else can't, just can't rip it off and put the same thing forward because they know it'll get, they'll know it'll get approved. That's a commercial thing. You know, no one would be the first person to put a product forward if they, didn't, if they weren't going to be able to make money out of it, frankly. So those kind of issues, the ministry was very receptive, which was good. I mean, when that, obviously they set the policy, which is as it should be, but they were receptive to hearing from the industry about what would work and what wouldn't work, how we thought it would work going forward, whether there were any obvious trip mines or, or pratfalls they were going to head into. So that was, that was really helpful, and that was, I think that's really important. So there's an open communication between the industry and the government, which is Absolutely, nice. Absolutely, yeah. So let me throw another factor into the mix, and this is going to be my last question that will be for the whole panel before I open up to everybody in the crowd to start asking questions of the panelists. Uh, we would be remiss in talking about emerging drugs without mentioning the, imp the impact that media has on the understanding of what these drugs are, what they do, how safe are they, et cetera. And that's in part how we got the title for this session. Um, Americans will know the very well-publicized story of a man in Miami who was a little uh, crazy out of his head. He uh, was found like biting somebody's face, and then they called this the zombie story and said he was on bath salts. Turned out, of course, that he wasn't on it, bath salts at all. He actually tested positive for marijuana, but we think in the end it's mostly a mental health issue. Anyway, the point being, can't unring that bell. That story is out there. And now when you mention bath salts, a lot of times the first thing people think about is the zombie thing. Now, like when we're doing harm reduction, that's obviously, in addition to already the challenges that the panel has brought up about just even understanding what these drugs are, what are their effects, how do we make it safe, in addition to all those regular level challenges, now we have this crazy media circus that we have to do. So I'm going to ask each of you to go one minute, like media impact, and how to, has it been good and bad, and how to make it work in the service of, you know, being, you know, putting good harm reduction practices out there? Well. It's mostly been bad, I think, <laughs> um, especially from for, for the work I do on the Hill. I mean, it, it's a lot of the policies driven by the media reports, the anecdotal reports. What a police officer who may or may not have been, have been at the scene of, a, of, of an incident said to a, a reporter in a small town somewhere, um, or the parent who blames the drug for you know the loss of their son or daughter, which you know. I'm not saying that didn't happen, but the fact is is that what we ha that's largely what we have to go on. I think you know. I think all of us have a responsibility to, to explain to the media what, what the real problem is here, you know, what we need to do about these drugs, that we need to start, you know, we really need to emphasize education, you know, we really need to focus on uh, ensuring that we don't criminalize people who use drugs, who use synthetic drugs, and we need to start emphasizing the science and looking and searching for the science around this. Um, and I think we, you know, I think the media can, um, they're never necessarily allies, but I think they can you know, we can start to work um, more effective messaging into the into the into what the media reports, and and and, and remind people when there's when it, when false information is put out there, such as with the bass, with the uh, Miami incident. Maria, well, um, what happened in Portugal is, as I've said, a very disappointing classical moral panic scenario, uh, where um, a small number uh, of uh, situations uh, of acute bad reactions uh, to uh, to a legal high would get uh, extremely uh, mediatized um, and receive a large attention. And there's also um, um, a number of uh, 
uh, influent uh, agents in the um, civil society that act as the moral guardi guardians uh, um, in, uh, uh, inside our political uh, uh, and legal framework of decriminalization that took clearly an advantage of this uh, new scenario to uh, um, um, make pressure uh, for this orientation in the in the law, I believe. Um, so media had uh, certainly uh, uh, a lot to do with uh, um, the uh, with the scenario we we have today to deal with these uh, with these new psychoactives uh, for all the bad reasons and the ones that are typically uh, known, mm -hmm. unfortunately. James. Yeah. Um Put it this way, in New Zealand it is illegal to advertise the sale of a psychoactive product. That doesn't matter because the New Zealand Herald will helpfully tell you what's on sale, where you can buy it from, and that it's mind-blowingly strong every second day. So it, it has been, a, it, that's, that's the least bad of it. I mean, they, they have ran, you know, the media has led to moral panic after moral panic after moral panic. And from a harm reduction perspective, the worst thing is every time, you know, the big old article about how terrible synthetic cannabis is, and a big picture of one of the leading brands. So. It's like why we, we, we've, we've tried to keep them keep the market under control, and at the same time, the media is just putting this stuff out there day after day after day. I mean, and most of it's semi-accurate, but it's the thing that and it is it is the thing that bothers me the most is the constant publicisation. You know, here's where you can get it. Here's where it's for sale. Here's what you can buy. It's so strong, and it's like, well, what do you think? What do you think the average 19-year-old reading that's going to get out of it? <laughs> The other, I mean, the other thing, obviously, as I said, we have a real issue with moral panic around this stuff, and everyone does. I mean, the most asinine example I, I'm aware of comes from Australia, where uh, a kid uh, fell off a balcony or something after overdosing on one of the MBOME hallucinogens, I forget which one, and the government said, oh, look, and the government, backed by the media, said, this is terrible, this is why we have to crack down on these legal highs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The kid thought he was using LSD. So it wasn't like a legal high scenario. He thought he was buying illegal drugs. Turned out they were actually legal and not good for him. So, <laughs> and we just get these kind of stories. I mean, the central papers are usually re fairly responsible. We head out to the provinces and it's just the same stuff over and over again, you know, day in, day out. And it's really unhelpful because it's inaccurate. And as I say, it's actually doing more to advertise the industry than the industry is. So um, that's, you know, completely sort of the opposite effect you'd want from a harm reduction perspective. Yep. Russ, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I do. Um, the, 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 the zombie case in America, so a week after that happened, there was a similar, there was a thing happened in Auckland, and the media reported this thing that this guy must have been on bath salts just because. But the media were just reporting what a police officer had said. So was it the media's fault for reporting the senior police officer, or was it the senior police officer's fault for pulling something out of his ass? But, but I'll put a different spin on the, yes, the New Zealand media coverage of these things has been really dreadful, but for, for a policy reform point of view, it's been really useful, because what it did was encourage politicians to move more quickly. And by the end, when you looked at the debate that took place over the two or three year period of the, as the bill progressed, by the end of it, all of the journalists, all of the opinion writers, all of the politicians had the same key message that, you know, the industry has to prove these products are low risk before they're sold. So all of the moral panic, while it's never usually good in drug reform, was really helpful because it, it, we ended up with a good result in the end. Right. Tim? I think, the media, I think the media in Ireland has been good and bad. Um, in a sense, we've had a lot of um, PMA-related overdoses um, or deaths in, in Ireland. We've had quite a number. And unfortunately, the media has kind of portrayed it as pure ecstasy. So there's been kind of no real kind of definition of what this, this has been. We've had a lot of other sort of uh, legal highs, sort of whatever you want to call them, um, issues where the, where the media's really got it wrong. Um, going, back to what Ross has, going back to what Ross has said, there has been examples where um, there's, been, you know, there's been high profile seizures of a white substance and the guard, you know, the, the law enforcement at the time have said, you know, this is methadrone or well, this is something else. Because really they didn't want anybody else to think it was crystal meth or something else. So I think the problem is at the moment, without actually getting the proper, you know, without getting the tox reports, 
we don't really know whether we, we don't know the seizures. I mean, we're only just getting the sort of tox reports back about, about recent seizures. But I mean, my experience of some of the Irish press, I mean, just, just I mean, this is for you guys as well, is that I've built kind of really good relationships with some of the journalists. Um, and we do, I mean, recently, about a year ago, um, there was a whole lot of stuff around PMA and stuff like that. And we were, well, it was actually able to get sort of some harm reduction messages out into the mainstream media, into some of the local papers in some of the national papers, where well, actually one of the national papers actually pu literally published a half page, um, literally sort of 10 points to harm reduction on how to reduce the risk of overdose, um, which I think is pretty, you know, which is pretty good. But so just, you know, I mean, just for yourselves, you know, build up um, your contacts with the journalists and you'll know the ones to trust. And the ones to trust, they'll come to you for the information and you can go to them for the information as well. Yep. And Carissa? <coughs> Well, um, I'd say that it's probably been good and bad. Um, bath salts, I mean, who knows what that is? Um, it definitely creates confusion. Um, Molly, if I hear one more article <laughs> say something about Molly being pure MDMA, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> Anybody can put a white powder in a capsule and call it Molly. Um, and so I think that a lot of times the media does more harm than good. Um, you know, ecstasy overdoses, somebody dies from an ecstasy overdose, what does that mean? Are they talking about MDMA? Are they talking about something else? Um, so just like the misinformation <clears throat> that is they put out there in relation to different drugs is definitely confusing. All right, so it's time for you guys to have a turn and ask questions of the panelists. I see one over here, I'm gonna go Walking all the way over. What's your question for the panel? Sure. Hi, panel. Uh, my name is Daniel Jabor. I'm the founder of the Psychedelic Society and a repeat tech startup founder uh, and a software engineer. And my question for you guys is um, in reference to the online uh, drug markets. You know, there's nothing new about online drug markets. College psychonauts have been buying gray market research chemicals online since the 1990s. But um, as Silk Road is being shutting down, we're seeing law enforcement trying to desperately to convey to the public that the underlying tech is not secure and that they're watching everybody and going to catch you. And I think the real reason for that is that the reason that they've been able to shut anything down ever, and I know a vendor on Silk Road that had trouble before it got shut down, because his girlfriend ratted on him, there's this human factor that tends to lead to uh, stuff like that getting caught. Um, but I think in Silk Road we see actually that uh, in its wake, eight plus popular Torp hidden sites are popping up, and we're seeing this mainstreaming of the online drug market. So as you said, it was self-regulating, and there was all these positive benefits. So here's my question. Do you have high hopes for uh, online drug markets? I mean, the vendor friend that I had that was selling drugs online uh, posted GCMS analysis reports of the drugs he was selling. I mean, I've never gotten a GCMS report from any drug dealer uh, before him. So. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, what do you guys think is the future? You know, do you think that these other sites are the answer? I mean, Tor may not be the answer, Bitcoin may not be the answer, but is technology um, the future of, of, you know, drug harm reduction? Great question. Who's yes. <laughs> no, I do. No, I do. I think that definitely it's been interesting to watch kind of what, see what's happened with Silk Road in regards to um, the actual kind of, I don't know if people know about it, there was, was a drug site, there was a drug site and there was a forum site. But what was really interesting is when actually the drug site got closed down, all the vendors and all the buyers, the forum was still open. So all the vendors and all the buyers were, were, show, were sharing their encryption keys and their email addresses. So it didn't actually close anything down. It just dismantled one person and part of the drugs market. So it's now... In a sense, there's more profit to be made from, these, from the vendors because they're not having to pay the transaction fees with, with on Silk Road. However, um, a number, a number, you know, obviously there's a number of um, there's a number of web, other websites like Sheep and Black Market Reloaded. But really, I mean, my in fairness, Black Market Reloaded they opened a thread for you know for Silk Road's community to sort of to to talk about talk about you know and to I suppose to communicate on, but we've seen other sites starting to come through as well. Um, and there's a lot, I think it's been actually, it's, it's almost like it's made, made the, the community stronger. Because, I mean, we've, we know there's um, the, 
from people. There was one, there's, there's a couple of I think there's a couple of people who are on the old Silk Road um, are now putting money, substantial money, into developing this old, you know, the new one, um, which is going which is going to be a lot more secure. And I think a lot of people, a lot more people, are more aware of that how you know encryption. And obviously, we know what what happened with with Freedom Host and everything, where Tormail got taken down as well. So I think a lot more people are much more aware. Uh, there's a lot more, I think. But definitely, I think it's definitely one of the, I can see it growing, definitely. I mean, you've only got to look at the price of Bitcoins. Bitcoin, um, you know, Bitco the price of Bitcoins went down. If anybody knows what Bitcoins are, do you? Yeah, grand. Um, <laughs> makes my life easier. Um, but that was a, it was about $1, I don't know, 35, 40. Now it's about one, it's what, $190 a bit, Bitcoin now. So that hasn't, you know, the market's definitely there. Let me throw a, a naysayer in there. Does like, isn't there an argument that it's just giving access to people that don't really know what they're doing anyway? They just heard about this thing, they can buy it online, and that's not very safe, or that's not a very good harm reduction practice. Let me actually toss that over to the New Zealanders and say, for the market that you're creating for legal highs that's going to be regulated, uh, is there going to be? Is it the preference that they be shops? Is it like online sales? How's that going to work? Well, the preference is probably shops, just because it's easier for the authority to keep an eye on what's going on. There is scope to sell online. That's, that's not prohibited, and you can, you can certainly do that. I'm not... I mean, one of the challenges has been, to be honest, that you can only sell from a website that exists purely for that purpose. And where that's difficult, of course, is if you're a head shop, and we've got a few big chains, you don't just sell legal highs. Mm. So you have to kind of have two websites or take all your other product off. or So... There is scope for online sale, presumably that you could ship, you could sell to overseas customers if you really wanted to. Um, but it's the preference is certainly retailers, simply because they're easier to control. You can keep kids out of it. You can put them you know, in out of the way places. Whereas at a website, you you can do your best with age verification, but there's always going to be that risk someone just gets their brother, you know, putting his date of birth or his credit card for them. So. Uh, there is scope for both. Probably the preference at the moment is, is for physical locations. Okay. Can I just, a very quick response to that. Um, I, I think the benefit of having it from a retail shop is that a well-trained yeah. shop, you know, retailer can talk to the, uh, can talk to the person who's going to buy the drugs. But from one of the things we've had in New Zealand are communities don't want these shops in their community. Yeah. You know, the so there's been problem. a lot of there's been a lot of moral panic about that, and so to address that, I actually think the online sales has an advantage for those communities who are quite conservative around these issues, yeah. and so yeah, that's true. the sales are online. We, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, and I think there's some benefit in that. Right. So it seems like that one is still open for debate. Okay. So I'm going to go to the next question here. Hi, my name is Devin Ringer. I'm a law student and a policy analyst at the Criminal Justice Policy Foundation. Um, I actually have one larger question, but first I wanted to start with a thought about what Carissa had mentioned about when you hear the term Molly overdose, what does that even mean? Uh, our organization has kind of taken to pushing back against the media by distinguishing between overdoses and poisonings. So that an overdose would be something that could only occur if what was consumed was what was desired, and a poisoning would be all of the, the broader category of defrauding and therefore the toxicity afterwards. So we found that to be quite successful in our PR dis distinctions. But the larger question I wanted to ask was for the New Zealanders. Um, here in the United States, our drug scheduling regime is, is I, I imagine, a bit different than what yours is. Uh, one of the biggest um, criticisms that people who are proposing the new amendment to change the Controlled Substances Act is that it costs so much money and time and human capital in order to actually go through what legislators would think is a rigmarole to find the same finding, that some analog is exactly the same as the other 20 analogs we've already scheduled. Um, the problem we also face is that here in the United States, if something, a chemical, is intended not for human consumption, it skips past all of the health and safety checks and goes straight to the market. As a result, there's a huge lobby of chemical producers who produce really odds and ends chemicals for specific purposes and put them to market and really don't want to have to spend money to have them tested beforehand. They're not involved in psychotropics at all. They're involved in, in lubricants, but they don't want to have this testing, and there's a ton of money behind that industry. So my question is, who bears the costs in New Zealand of paying for these tests and how do you know which new chemicals coming to market you need to test under the uh, psychedelic 
sentencing law or the psychedelic scheduling law because it seems to me that you wouldn't know that a substance is psychedelic until you've tested it. So how do you prevent the broader outrage from the testing? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, um, and it's one that, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of grey around the fringes of how it works. Basically, every substance that is, every substance, article, object, or thing that is capable of inducing a psychoactive effect by any means in a person is technically covered by the legislation. Now, obviously, since that includes, you know, paint and colours and sunlight, um, that's, uh, that's not actually how it works in practice. And the key test is whether or not it's been administered for the primary purpose of inducing a psychoactive effect. That's pretty vague, and in, the, in classic New Zealand terms, uh, we just know, we, we know when we see it. I mean, pe there was, there has been for a while, a, um, there was sort of a tendency to sell these kind of products as like fish food or CD cleaner that was popular for a while, or incense. Um, the new legislation allows the authority to de specifically declare a substance, article, object or thing to be a psychoactive substance or to not be a psychoactive substance. And the intention there is for there to be some clarity. The example that's given quite often is, for example, if you want to grow a psychoactive plant in your back garden, that's fine, they don't care. If you want to put it up in little bags that say super high on it and claim it's not for human consumption, you know, they're not, don't take the piss. You know, they, they, it's a New Zealand phrase, but you know, they're going to know. You know you, everyone knows when these products are up, up there and intended for human use for a psychoactive effect. And the expectation is that those products will be covered if your product merely happens to have a psychoactive effect but is actually, you know, as you say, a lubricant or something else, because the intention is not that it will be administered for the primary purpose, you should be in the clear. But if someone took that exact same substance and packaged it up for retail sale and sold it at a head shop, obviously then you'd be looking at inducing a psychoactive effect on purpose, so you would be covered. Okay, going over here for a question. Yeah, my name's Malakar Vorjic. Um, I actually have one quick co uh, comment about uh, sample bias for Maria and, and Carissa. And what I think is really going on here is that you're facing two different questions. And in Boom Festival, the question you're facing is, how good is my MDMA? And in the festivals in the US, you're asking, is this MDMA? <laughs> <laughs> and so you get very different numbers when you're looking at that. So 80% comes back, yeah, it's MDMA, it's of good quality. And 20%, well, okay, this stuff wasn't so good. And in the other side, you're getting only 20% is actually MDMA. So that's just a sample bias that's occurring based on attendees. Now, my question for the whole panel, though, is this has been an ongoing war against language first. When Henry Anslinger came before Congress, he didn't say hemp, he said marijuana. And the media went right in tow with that, reporting all kinds of psychotic crap. Now, modernly, it's bath salts or molly or whatever, but I mean, what is our strategy to defeat this? Because it's been working for 100 years and still going. And to me, it's, uh, whenever I hear it, it says Ludacris is saying, it's not cocaine, it's this new drug called blow. I mean, really? I mean, really, guys? Are we going to fall for this again? So I think your question is about different names of things and reinventing. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, <clears throat> in the United States, most of these drugs are being made to get around drugs that are illegal. So I think that that's going to be the bottom line. The reason why 80% of the stuff that I test is not MDMA is because, you know, they're trying to make this thing to go around MDMA or, you know, marijuana or whatnot. So I think that that's probably the original problem. And since, you know, you, uh, um, <clears throat> in Portugal, it's all the drugs are decriminalized. They don't have to have all these different drugs to go around the drugs because they're all legal. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, our, our, our problem um, of, in the experience of, um, of testing in BOOM and all the related consequences that come from what's available have, uh, from recent years, had always more to do on shortage of some very uh, um, demanded uh, product. Uh, it happened with uh, MDMA in 2010 that because of the Olympics, apparently China uh, developed this very harsh persecution of a number of uh, precursors uh, uh, of MDMA. And because of that, 
all over Europe, there was this huge shortage of MDMA. It reflected in the products available in the festival. And uh, um, in 2000, and, uh, I, I'm sorry, I mentioned 2010, I meant 2008. Um, uh, and because of that, um, at that particular time, we had a problem with MDMA. There was the, it was the, the cutting and the adulteration had a lot of levamizole. Um, uh, people were unaware of it. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and um, uh, that was a problem, that edition. Re more recently, in, 2000, in 2012, uh, uh, it was a problem with LSD and blue microdots that weren't LSD after all because there was a let an LSD shortage. So uh, um, um, it's not just how good are they, is this, is, it is also <laughs> are they available enough? <laughs> it's also another, another issue. And we've always seen pro increasing problems when uh, uh, um, availability is compromised for highly demanded products. Okay, I'm going to go to the next question because I want to get a couple more in and we're about 10 minutes left. Thank you. Hi, um, uh, my name is Brun Gonzalez. I'm from Espolea, from Mexico. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned a while ago um, the importance of the thin layer chromatography test or analysis. Um, and I wanted to ask if you could comment or expand a little bit uh, as it how it compares with uh, gas or mass spectrometry and uh, the importance of quantitative and qualitative results and how those two tests correlate and what each one provides. And I am not the right person to answer to you because I don't major in psychopharmacology or, uh, or chemistry. Uh, I only have a basic notion of the thin layer chromatography. Uh, uh, I'm not into chemistry, so, uh, uh, but I can put you in contact with the people that develop this and are very specialized uh, in Europe, namely uh, at Portuguese team Shekin from uh, uh, PIJ agency, here represented by my friend uh, José. Uh, or energy control specialists in Spain that have been doing this for a long time. They are perhaps the, the best people to, to answer to you. So I have a basic notion that thin layer chromatography acts on a, 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 by comparison, by, by contrast of the sample with a panel of, uh, of products. Uh, uh, and uh, this, this contrast allows the uh, thorough identification of all the products uh, present in a sample. Uh, this is all uh, a psychologist can say on the subject, sorry. <laughs> Just want to say two things. One is to correct Maria, because lava missile, is, it was present in cocaine. It was not in MDMA. Okay, it was, oh, yeah. But, and it was, yes, but it was a very uh, problematic issue, lava missile in Portugal. And also that MDMA um, outside Boom Festival uh, contains a lot of caffeine and that we can see that in party scenes in Lisbon and Porto, the two main cities of Portugal. So most part of the time it's some kind of placebo effect that you know caffeine uh, produce on people. So, and that's quite interesting to see at the same time. So it doesn't, do, doesn't have anything to do with decriminalization. You know, people can always twist drugs, can always you know, produce in small labs at uh, their own kitchens and so on. So it's a different, I think, story. The second thing, I think it's more directed to you, the panels, sp uh, mainly to the European ones. Um, we know that EMCDDA is the European Monitoring Center for Drug um, Control. Uh, is trying to increase more and more drug, drug testing at the uh, European level. But at the same time, the national agencies, even in Portugal, they are attacking drug testing because they are afraid of drug testing. They say, for example, it happened with us with Aptash, they say that if we do drug testing, we are promoting drugs. So how do you think we can overcome this kind of paradox? You know, we have the, the European agency saying we need drug testing to control drugs, the, the quality of drugs, the quality of use, but at the same time, the national agencies, they are attacking that. Great question. I would say that, you know, the drug testing is always going to be controversial, but in the end, if you can provide a test for somebody, you could potentially save their life. 
I think one of the I was at the uh, psychoactive substance conference in, in for the MCDA recently, and one of the one of the things that really came out was the lack of markers that was available for a lot of these a lot of these novel psychoactive substances, and that's definitely you know, that's that's definitely a problem. I mean, the interesting thing I was about is we were finding that law some of the law enforcement um, in various countries were actually buying off Silk Road, and they were actually developing markers from the from from the drugs they were buying from Silk Road. So it wasn't necessarily um, to, for seizures, but it was famous as a harm reduction measure to actually know what's actually out there. And that was the only way they were doing it, but now it's gone, so we don't know. That's a very tough question that I think we're also going to keep addressing, and probably in two years when we do this session again, it'll still be a question that we're wondering about. Uh, I'm sorry, let me just add something. Uh, um, I think that so, uh, maybe a, res a, res a response that is uh, pragmatical, uh, because in Portugal what happens is that testing is part of the measures uh, you can adopt in the harm reduction uh, laws, so it is uh, uh, contemplated in the law, but then, of course, as uh, José has said, uh, there are practical problems in what concerns the manipulation of substances, their transportation, the the, the actual uh, uh, um, manipulation of the products by the by the people that are that uh, are doing the testing. So. Uh, um, I believe perhaps the way is to be pragmatical about it and to educate law enforcement uh, uh, because we have a decriminalization law. It has over 10 years of implementation. It has been successful up to date or until economic deprivation has arrived uh, at least. And uh, um, uh, But this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a criminal justice um, judges, uh, uh, prosecutors, uh, um, uh, police agencies are totally Totally aware of the harm reduction message and the implications of the uh, of the of the drug. So if uh, if that alliance can be established with uh, with drug with uh, law enforcement, um, it probably solves the problem. So I think it's a matter of, of uh, investing in their education uh, and being pragmatical about about it. Boom has been successful in doing that kind of partnership with the local enforcement law enforcement agencies surrounding the festival, and this has proven uh, um, beneficial because they don't interfere really what happens inside a festival and they're very cooperative and also the festival uh, uh, promoters themselves cooperate with law enforcement to help identify problematic trafficking uh, situations and uh, uh, other relevant law enforcement issues. Um, but inside the festival, these me measures are not threatened because of this cooperation and understanding of the purpose of the festival and the purpose of this intervention. So. But of course, this is in Idanha Nova, which is this secluded area in Portugal where everything is easy to 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 get to go to to implement. I gotta, we have to go to a broader level, uh, perhaps. I'm intrigued by the idea of, of uh, you know, working with law enforcement to um, to really to really grow in this area in the United States and other countries that don't have the drug checking sort of put in place at festivals and nightlife areas. Um, so I, I think that's an area that, w that we can grow here in the United States. And I think it might, you know, it can, it can be, um, it can be uh, approached as an, a way of better understanding what's, out, what's happening out there, you know, because right now we're relying, in the United States, we're relying on DEA data, and, and that's more or less, my understanding that's more or less all we have, and so, um, for the most part. So I, I think that's an interesting area to look into. Hi, my name is Peter Sharshi. I come from Hungary. Uh, at this session, you were talking about uh, legal highs only in the context of dance festivals and people attending uh, dance clubs. But in my country and in some other countries of the eastern and central part of Europe, there is a big uh, number of people who inject uh, legal highs, like thousands of, uh, of marginalized drug users injecting legal highs, and it has completely different you know, implications, for example, uh, heroin user injects three or four times, but a mephedrone injector injects uh, 15 times a day. So it, 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 it has a lot of risk of uh, HIV and Hep C. So do you have any experiences with injecting legal highs in, in your countries? I did a study in 2011, and if I'm correct, I think, I think Ireland was the first place to actually see injecting mephedrone. Um, yeah, I mean, it was amongst a bunch of homeless. Um, it was, I mean, it was amongst the homeless population, and it was. 
there, you know, there was there was obviously um, fairly sort of psychotic effects, you know, effects from this. From this, again, we were we were, we were seeing um, people injecting 15, 16, 17 times a day. Uh, where there's a number of people I've spoken to would have had um, been on HIV treatment, uh, would have just left their HIV, HIV treatment. Um, they could have been. And what we were also seeing, we were, we were seeing a lot of um, abscesses um, and, I suppose, injecting related injuries that we, we would never have seen before. And the one of the, I suppose, as a harm reduction measure, if you are, if you are injecting with method, if you are working with methadrone users, is that a lot of the methadrone people would actually think they would need to cook up the methadrone, but the methadrone you don't have to cook up. You actually, sh it, it, it's water soluble. And the problem is with when, when, the, when um, methadrone is actually heated, it solidifies. And what we were, we were actually finding, it was actually either solidifying in the barrel or actually in people's veins. And the, I'm not going to be gross, um, but the way the spots or the abscesses would grow, they would actually grow in rather than out. And so it was, you know, people would, like, would squeeze the spots and the whole thing would just literally just burst open with gangrene. And, you know, I saw a number of people would have had their, um, it was a couple of like, amputations, I, you know, that, that would, I would have seen as well. Not seen it so much now, um, but I think the interesting thing about it is the methadrone we were seeing at the time was from China, which was, which was synthesized with bromine. So that was, that was causing the, the, the rebounds and the, that, that rebound effect. Now, since then, I suppose through investigation, we've actually seen a lot of methadrone being synthesized in India. And it seems to be purer and it's more of an MDMA effect rather than this, this stuff that's coming through from, from China. I don't know if that helps you or not, but... From a, from a New Zealand perspective, um, back in the, what we might call the Wild West, it, it was always made very clear by the Ministry of Health that presenting a legal high for injection was unacceptable and that any product that was presented in that way would be banned immediately. Um, under the new regime, it's been sort of equally made informally pretty clear that substances that you inject, or that are presented for injection or that are used with a syringe or even that are snorted for that matter, they won't get past the front door. You know, that's, it's never been, I think, a huge, a huge issue, but the view has always been, from a New Zealand context, that injection in the context of legal highs is just not on the table at all, from a regulatory perspective anyway. Okay, so um, we are almost at time. I wanna just close by saying, I wanna, I wanna make it really real for you guys. Um, this is a very contemporary issue. Like, this is a very important contemporary issue that I think we're gonna have to come back to a lot. During this session, I actually received a text message from my fellow organizers that we had somebody um, collapse actually here at the conference, and uh, they think that it was Spice that that person was on. And so they've been transported to the hospital at this point, and we just hope things are gonna go well for them, but I just think it, it really brings home the conversation that we are having in this room right now and the need for more conversations like this to happen education to get out there and for us to really focus on how to do the best we possibly can with harm reduction practices and outreach. So I want to thank these panelists for their contributions. Thank you to the audience. And that's it. Oh, and don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Sorry, have to throw that in.